episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, once again uh, to another episode of our show, bringing you another fascinating guest, uh, helping to create uh, a better tomorrow for all of us on many different fronts. Uh, and here we are on the, uh, the eve of the United Nations International Day of Older Persons 2021. And we have the honor of being joined by none other than Dr. Eveline Bishop, uh, who is an expert in internal medicine and oncology uh, with a focus on preventative and precision medicine, uh, biogerontology, and geronto-oncology. Uh, Dr. Bishop is, is deeply passionate about next generation medical technologies uh, and their application of tools such as artificial intelligence for biomedical research and practice. Uh, she spent the last decade practicing medicine and performing translational research uh, all around the world from Switzerland to the United States to China. Uh, Dr. Bishop is a, a medical doctor with her uh, MD degree from Max Planck Institute um, of Biology and Genetics. Uh, she interned at Columbia University, Harvard and Beth Israel, a medical deaconess. Uh, she is is the author of over uh, 40 peer-reviewed papers and is a quite frequent speaker at scientific and medical conferences uh, around the world. Uh, when she's not doing all of that, she also has time to be assistant professor at Shanghai University of Medicine and Health Sciences. Uh, she's an associate faculty at Shanghai uh, Zhitong University and a researcher at University Hospital in Basel. Uh, in the private sector, she uh, is a longevity physician uh, at the Human Longevity Inc., a clinical advisor to in silico medicine, uh, and scientific advisor to uh, Hall Musk, a uh, unique behavioral health company. Uh, and quite recently, uh, she has taken on another role as a head of the advisory board for uh, the new Longevity Science Foundation, a uh, Swiss foundation that's committing to uh, distributing over a billion dollars over the next 10 years to research institutions and projects focusing on healthy aging and longevity. Uh, a lot of exciting topics to talk about. Uh, Dr. Evelyn Bishop, uh, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the show today. Today. Thank you so much, Hira, for having me here. It's such a great pleasure. And thank you so much for this uh, really uh, amazing introduction, abundant in praises. Um, <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's really a great pleasure and honor. Well, you know, you have a lot going on. And, you know, I, I'd like to, as we typically do, start off just by handing you the floor for a little more of the background. Um, you know, watching you, you know, you are a really a global physician. You're on the go. You're everywhere around the world at all times. Talk a little bit about the, your background, a little bit about where you grew up, when you got interested in medicine, when you got interested in aging and gerontology, and a little bit of your early career journey. I think that would be a, a great way to start things off. Sure, uh, with pleasure. So, uh, indeed, I have uh, had the chance to train in several continents, which uh, was definitely uh, something that gave me a lot of input and uh, a lot of experience and a lot of um, capability to understand different mentalities in different cultures and also different healthcare systems and also uh, the needs, hopefully, also of different um, patients and then societies, populations, and so on. Also recently, I, uh, I added an MPH to my title uh, from, from the University of Liverpool, um, specializing in international health and global health. Uh, so um, that, was, um, that was definitely also very helpful to, to understand what is going on specifically in the arena of uh, demographics and aging. So, um, but uh, on, on the boring side, I, uh, you know, I grew up in Germany. I studied there. I've, um, I've um, completed my studies at the University of Dresden. Uh, and um, as you mentioned, my MD was from Max Planck Institute in that same city. And uh, at the same time, I was also working partially for the European Parliament at the time. That allowed me to frequently go to China which is why when the time was over with my studies, I moved the, there, here, I'm currently in China, I'm currently in Shanghai um, for the first part of my internship. Um, then I moved to the US. I was very uh, blessed to get a grant to um, rotate in uh, Harvard Med School, so Beth Econess, um, Beth Israel, MGH, and um, Dana Farber, and then moved to New York. And when I came back, to 
pursue my residency and fellowship, I chose Switzerland as the country where I would like to do that. So um, ever since my, let's say, return to Europe, I have been in between two countries. I have been practicing clinically at the University of Zurich and then University Hospital of Basel that actually trained me fully as an internist to the point uh, pre-COVID um, that I was working as an attending physician, the department or division of internal medicine there at the University Hospital of Basel. But I was actually constantly in between two countries. So I was uh, living in Shanghai and in Switzerland, um, pursuing research, academia and teaching here in Shanghai primarily, of course, partially in, in, in Switzerland as well, and combining the cleaning there um adding to the experience um in terms of longevity and uh, that's actually something um that um that is connected to my specialty so i'm an internist mm -hmm. internal medicine specialist but i also had a special interest in oncology mm -hmm. and my research was mostly focusing on biomarkers preventative and predictive biomarkers so whatever we could find to, um, to identify cancer very early or to identify metastatic relapses and so on at an early stage. And at some point of time, I also got involved more and more in the so-called at that time, oldest old oncology. So really, how do we take care of patients um, that are 70 and above, mm -hmm. since as we know, the randomized controlled trials um, do not really include this specific part of the population, which anecdotally is actually, or ironically, is the part of population that is suffering from cancer the most. Sure. Number one risk factor to develop cancer is not genetics, it's, uh, it's not uh, lifestyle, it's age. So, um, so that was one of the reasons how I got more and more involved also into aging, since especially the cancerogenic pathways and the aging pathways are so extremely interrelated. Mm -hmm. And also at that moment, I was very, um, I was very lucky to meet some of the QOLs in the field, especially Alex Javoronkov from In Silico Medicine and Deep Longevity that, um, and that allowed me really to get more into the field. Alex was a fantastic uh, mentor and, um, and a collaborator on, on many of, of research projects. And this is how it all started. And it started in Shanghai on a Sunday <laughs> at 11 p.m. <laughs> um, and developed ever since. Excellent. Excellent. And, and you know, you, you, you mentioned a lot of things there, and there's a lot of exciting topics that, that I want to go into with you. And, and, and I think, I, you know, I'd love to start off. Uh, you mentioned Alex Avarankov. Uh, there was a, an article about you that he wrote in Forbes magazine recently uh, uh, entitled Women in Longevity Medicine and the Rise of the Longevity Physician, uh, which, you know, it talks about uh, sort of the birth of this new field. And as you were just mentioning, you know, um, in the case of sort of the elder oncology, uh, you know, we think about, you know, a lot about sort of uh, the, the drug development side of things. But um, in this particular case, as you were just pointing out, uh, we don't you know, study drugs in, 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 in uh, elderly people, especially in oncology. Um, and, and so there's a separate field there, uh, medicine, right? You practice medicine all the time. You're not always waiting for the next drug to 20 years or so to come along that may pass or fail. Talk about the, the field of longevity medicine and sort of uh, how it exists sort of alongside, you know, what we, you know, a lot of the guests I've had on the show that are developing these new drugs that may or may not be here in 15 years. But you have to practice medicine every day. Uh, it's, it's a different perspective on things because you're learning. Every patient is a different learning experience, especially the patients who aren't in clinical trials. Talk a little bit about longevity medicine in general, what it means to you. Mm -hmm. Oh, with great pleasure. I think it's a great uh, question that we also try to ask in, in some of the um, venues uh, where we had MD, PhDs uh, in our panels, for example, at the AARDD at the Longevity Medicine Workshop, we actually started off with the question, what is longevity medicine? How do you define it? And of course, this is not a provocative question. It's just a question uh, more or less in order to really have a better picture of how people that are in the field are understanding the field. And I think this, um, um, <laughs> 
biovariability uh, also in terms of how one looks at it and how everybody is involved um, is, um, is uh, very helpful because we are now shaping something that will hopefully become a new medical discipline. That's my personal wish and goal and it is being shared by, by uh, many of, of, of the colleagues that are in the field. And as you correctly mentioned, I am, um, I am looking at those amazing developments in neurosciences, in longevity, uh, in longevity sciences, in the research. Um, they are tremendous. They are extremely fascinating, uh, very promising, um, both on the level of molecular pathways or on, in general on the pathways of aging, um, determination of new targets, then development of new targets, then actually also animal experiments that are uh, in, in most cases also very promising. And me being a little bit on the other side, um, or, you know, we, we always say bench to, uh, to bed, I'm more on the bed to, to bench side. Mm -hmm. um, I see um, perhaps two things um, that are right now happening and um, uh, that will, you know, lay the foundation for further for further development. Right now, for me, longevity medicine is very clearly, and as we stated it actually in our paper recently with um, um, Alex Jabronkov and Dr. Kai Fuli, um, I believe longevity medicine is really AI-driven precision medicine. Mm -hmm. that's, that's longevity medicine for me. And I believe it's important to uh, really pinpoint that longevity medicine is a field that is in very inclusive of almost all other disciplines because all other um, arenas of, of medicine are important. However, the cutting edge of longevity medicine is actually the deployment of AI, AI now in very broad sense, so specifically also deep learning in that, in that sense, to make sense out of the data that are existing that are by far not optimal. And we know that. We all know of the biases that are coming along with them. Uh, we know that we are far from being you know, clean and, and perfect. And, and we know that the AI algorithms are just as good as the data that we fuel. Um, but nevertheless, I believe that this is the moment where we have to do something in order to uh, make those data useful that are already existing and then build also guidelines, recommendations, and, and really perpetuate the field by saying, oh, how can we do it better? And can, mm -hmm. how can we improve? And on the scientific side, this is already ongoing, and that's very beautiful. On the clinical side, it's still burgeoning. And um, this is mostly because the clinical guidelines, and the clinical recommendations, the clinical setting of, of uh, the golden standards is very strict, mm -hmm. understandably. Yeah, so there is a little bit of, of, of a bridge that we have to do uh, of the translation of the science to the clinic. And this is where I find my passion. This is where uh, I thrive. And this is where also I see most of my patients um, being you know, grateful for and also very appreciative when they see somebody that is on top of, of the game and, and knowing the developments. And they are very open also to uh, to changes. So mm -hmm. um, there's constantly new research coming up. Uh, some of the research is giving us new insight that are perhaps, uh, you know, changing our view of, of, of some of the interventions. And, and then we are also switching the gears and the mm -hmm. patients are very enthusiastic. And what I see also uh, is that the patients are coming with, with their great ideas, mm -hmm. uh, what we can do in order also to, to translate some of the research and also to develop new research. Uh, they're also very much willing to participate in, in trials, even if those trials are not on a level of really um, big N number uh, RCT. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in longevity medicine, any type of uh, clinical study that is, of course, ethical and well structured, and uh, you know, um, of course, uh, bringing them uh, solid evidence, but not necessarily in those in those dimensions as as we are used to, you know, with those hundreds and thousands of um, of sample size uh, participants. Um, even those studies are very useful, just for us to to have, you know, 
the foundation, the basics. Yep. A lot, uh, a lot of things that I could talk about, and it's, and it's very, very um, interesting. But also maybe just to uh, point out one thing: at this moment, longevity medicine uh, is um, is selling on two pillars, and one pillar is um, is probably a little bit, not a little bit, is much stronger than the other one. Um, this is the prevention. So one thing is the diagnostics, precision okay. diagnostics, and the other. The other part of longevity medicine will be at some point of time the really the precision um, intervention mm -hmm. say, or precision uh, therapies that will be uh, deployed to again not really to make somebody live forever. That is not the goal of True. longevity medicine, right? So we are extending the healthy lifespan, mm -hmm. so the, the the amount of years um, that are lived in good health mm -hmm. without comorbidities right. that are impactful for the quality of life. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, as you're talking about this, and you brought up the, um, it's a fascinating paper, I don't understand much of it, but uh, entitled Artificial Intelligence and Longevity Medicine, it's uh, you, Alex Severankov, and, and uh, Kaifu Lee, uh, Nature Aging, and, and you you know, this is this very comprehensive model. It's based on, and what I'm talking out of my <laughs> out of my scope here, but deep generative reinforcement learning. And you go through, as you were saying, every every aspect of of this of the system. Um, I don't want you to I don't want you to explain the paper or go into a lecture. I'm sure you could lecture about this for hours. But um, you'd mentioned diagnostics and then um, sort of some you know some picking some sort of optimal treatment. Uh, Talk us about other things. What what else excites you in terms of the um, the basket of new tools coming from artificial intelligence per this fascinating model uh, for your particular practice? What, what other things are you excited about per the AI mm -hmm. uh, systems? Yes, yeah, so um, I, I was definitely very fortunate to co-author this paper and uh, be in between uh, as, I was, I was, as I was comparing, you know, being in between um, the the biggest stars of of AI. Um, it's like, you know, putting yourself between, uh, I don't know, uh, Ben Affleck and, uh, <laughs> and Angelina Lee of, of, of uh, you know, of artificial intelligence, very, very high level. So, um, but for myself taking, it, you know, now to the clinic and to the patient, uh, I'm definitely mostly excited about the deep learning. So the method of, um, as I explained it to, to, to myself very simply, of taking the data that are there, the longitudinal data that I would anyway be using in the clinic, but on a much, much lower level of my comprehension, understanding, and and amount of um, of, of identifying the right data from from all it, uh, from all of those, and to put trajectories in order to identify what I want to identify. Mm -hmm. uh, simply said. Deep learning is giving me the option of using data that I have without me um, needing to select and filter data mm -hmm. that are potentially important or not. The, the system does it for me. Okay. And then I can, I can identify an objective function, as we say, something that I want to have. For example, what is right now for this patient, this moment, the right intervention or the right drug or um, or something that that I am using on a daily basis with my with my patient is, for example, the employment of deep uh, aging clocks. Um, there are different types of aging clocks, and and um, those that I am using the most are those that are um, giving me a, a good follow up and a good continuation uh, in a, in a, in the short terms. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the biological uh, age clock based on blood markers, so the um, the so called HEMO age. So. Um, this is a great example of deep learning applied in the clinic already. Yeah? I put the parameters that are being identified and also are constantly developing. And um, the algorithm is not only giving me the biological age of the patient, which is already a great thing. So I can track and I can see if, if we are moving towards the right direction. But on top of that, what is much more important, the algorithms are telling me what is the optimal biological age for this patient at this mm. time? And which are the parameters that still have to be optimized to which uh, 
to which uh, value, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and those values are not uh, the same by far uh, as the ranges of, of the parameters that we are used to in the clinic. So our ranges are based on studies that were done decades ago and uh, we are kind of, and of course are based on the population mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. studies. Meanwhile, in those type of uh, AI deep learning applications of, of, of aging clocks, um, it's very, not even personalized, it's, it's mm -hmm. almost individualized, yeah. So this is, uh, this is something that is fascinating and I, and I guess um, another arena which, um, which is very um, well developed, for example, in Human Longevity Inc., where I'm one of the um, yep. longevity concierge physicians, what is extremely fascinating um, is really uh, applying AI-based solutions uh, in um, early diagnostics or in okay. longevity diagnostics. And again, this is different to what we have been, you know, used to in the clinic, which, which we, we already have very good screening settings. We have good uh, uh, early prevention uh, interventions in the clinic. We have even national programs and so on. Longevity medicine takes it to a whole different level mm -hmm. with the ultimate goal of identifying the specific individual risks of a patient mm -hmm. to develop some diseases at a later point of time. And optimally, we would be able to identify those diseases already at birth. Mm -hmm. And then not only to identify them, it's one thing to identify them, that the patient then would ask, so what, right? So if I know I have this and that risk, great. So we, we might all say we, we are at risk of this and that, of diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, and so on. But this type of diagnostics should also help us not to, not only to, to identify the risk, but then also to mitigate the risk. Mm -hmm. So we will find the right monitoring, the right protocol of, of early detection precision diagnostics mm -hmm. to, um, to, 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 if at all, find the disease or also to, to mitigate the disease. And uh, I think, and this is one of the pillars that I was talking about. So, so longevity medicine really stands on those two legs, the precision diagnostics mm -hmm. on, on an extremely top level, and then the therapeutics. Good. And what is the, also the, really the competitive advantage of, of longevity medicine diagnostic is that um, you are constantly generating data and you are mm -hmm. constantly learning. As the machine is learning, um, we are improving. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is something that is really ongoing. And um, we know that all disciplines of medicine are evolving and growing and we have to constantly learn. But in longevity medicine, it's not only us who is learning, it's the AI that is learning with us mm -hmm. and much faster than us. So, um, you know, this hand in hand of uh, human intelligence and artificial intelligence, and also this extreme inclusion of all disciplines and at the end of the day, also um, a very, very unique symbiosis of computational scientists and geroscientists mm -hmm. and clinicians, because we, in, in other disciplines, it is important and, and beneficial to communicate and to work sure. together. Here, it's uh, mandatory. <laughs> um, there is no way around it. Right. So um, that is something very unique and uh, very interesting and with a bright future. Totally. You know, um, as we um, now think a little bit more about the, the drug developments, obviously there's a huge uh, potential, you know, you were, you were within Silico Medicine, there's a lot of uh, other companies doing AI and, and new drug discovery out there. But one of the very interesting topics, we've done a few shows where, where the theme has come up is, is this principle of repurposing, uh, you know, that we have a millions of potential drugs out there that pharma companies and so forth have already created. Uh, let's retake a look at them with some of these new technologies. And I, I bumped into um, actually a pretty recent paper of your it was entitled uh, Rapid Identification of Druggable Targets and the Power of Phenotype Simulator for Effective Drug Repurposing, in this particular case about COVID-19. But um, drug repurposing is also a very hot theme. Um, talk a little bit, I, I know this is a rather new paper, but uh, and, and we'll get to Rapalogs in the next question because rapamycin usually pops up <laughs> in some of these re repurposing discussions. But talk a little bit about this paper, if you would, and, and what the Phenotype Simulator is. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> you, uh, um, you you really did uh, great research in the background. I'm I'm very grateful, you know, also that you are bringing up this paper, which um, 
interestingly is not um it's not connected to longevity medicine research uh, arena that that i'm involved in okay. but also related since okay. uh, actually what happened was that at the time of COVID, when COVID started uh there were global consortia being built um and one of those um global consortiums was built around but mishra from new york university also a very um uh, prominent person in in ai and computational mm. science uh introduced of course by alex javronkov and um within this global framework of various stakeholders so not only scientists but also uh economists and data scientists and uh, it uh, people and so on um so uh, yeah also uh we had several people from the sociology area. Anyway, so in this global consortium, we also uh, kind of uh, found ourselves into smaller groups. And the group that um, I'm very fortunate to be a part of is a group of um, drug repurposing um, mm -hmm. for COVID. And FENZIM is a very interesting um, system okay. that is not only allowing to identify um, the potential of drugs that are already existing, meaning really drug repurposing, mm -hmm. um, but also is allowing to stimulate um, the, the research and to simulate the efficacy of a drug and also to look at the pathways of where this drug is working mm -hmm. um, in a specific setting. So simply um, explained specifically also in this paper, we are showing how we were able to, based on what the science already knows of COVID the virus and the pathways that the virus is using in order to attack specific cells and the target that's, uh, that are being um, uh, tackled, specifically genetic targets mm -hmm. of, um, of uh, you know, the membrane settings, for example, on the cells where, where the virus is docking on. And then, based on this um, knowledge, we were able to simulate with the with the with the system um, the efficacy of some of the drugs, right? And of course, there we had the uh, typical uh, typical targets that that were anyway um, used already partially in the clinic. The mm -hmm. system also re-identified them some 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 of the prednisones, uh, some of the mTOR inhibitors. Uh, some of the AC inhibitors, but then the, the next level of, of this development was really also to see how, where, and to which extent exactly those drugs are working on the virus itself. Mm. This is what the system is doing. And this is applicable for basically anything, right? Mm -hmm. So we did it for COVID, but uh, one can do it for basically any disease um, that is... Um, that is not necessarily communicable disease, meaning it doesn't always have to be a pathogen that we are looking at. Sure. Actually, the next the next step and the next level for us, or we are actually already working on it, is to look at diabetes mm. with this system, right? And and really to find some of the new targets and drug uh, drugs that can be repurposed in order to um, to uh, yeah to 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 tackle especially uh, diabetes. Mm. And I, I'll sort of leaning, leaning that a little bit now into uh, aging. Um, you also have these two papers, one where you focus the increased pace of aging and COVID-related mortality, and then obviously the potential of rapalogs to, to uh, increase human resilience uh, in SARS-CoV infection, reduce severity of COVID-19. Um, talk about a little bit about the sort of your insights and, and work. I, I remember that was about several months ago during the, the height of the pandemic, but talk a little bit about your thoughts, your learnings on that, and then this principle of resilience uh, and, and, and maybe some of what you could be, you know, obviously resilience is a major component of, of the aging process and then keeping aging at bay. Talk a little bit about what you're learning in, in, in regard to this. Mm -hmm. um, great question. Thank you for that question. So uh, those two papers were a great adventure and, and um, of course, a, a great uh, learning all along. So the number one paper was um, partially docking on a paper that uh, at the very beginning of the pandemics, Alex published on mm. uh, geroprotective mechanisms uh, that should be applied and should be looked at um, in cases of uh, pandemics uh, like this. Uh, and also talking about how aging is related to, uh, of course, weaker immunity, weaker mounting of uh, um, 
vaccination efficacy mm -hmm. and how geoprotective interventions can be actually supportive um, in, in, in arenas where we have emergencies like this, where we have to very quickly, rapidly boost um, the immunity of, um, of, of people, of populations. And at the same time, knowing that um, this is, well, hopefully it is, but uh, uh, realistically it will not be the last pandemic that we are facing. Right. Uh, or even an epidemic. So what what definitely this crisis is showing us or, or uh, pointing us uh, towards is how can we boost immunity? How can we um, support with longevity medicine that people are being more resilient, um, have better immunity and and less frailty? Yeah, so uh, immunity, immuno aging, uh, inflammation, inflammaging, these are all uh, parts of, of aging processes, and mm -hmm. these are all targets that longevity medicine is looking at with different interventions. Um, not only drugs, hopefully, at some point of time, we will have also very good uh, compounds that, that uh, mm -hmm. would be used, and senolytics, um, and, and really good gel protectors on the market mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um but uh, even until then we already know that some of the interventions um that that we can do um and apply are useful and helpful so for example for, for immunity boosting and uh, you mentioned rapamycin at the beginning and we took in in our paper uh, rapamycin as one of the examples um because there are already randomized control trials or at this phase two trials on rapamycin and, right. and quite a uh, large amount of evidence in basic science that rapamycin uh, as an, or in general you know mTOR inhibitors but specifically rapamycin um, is um, to some extent reversing mm -hmm. the biological age uh, on a cellular level and and on a system level mm -hmm. right so um Having this type of um, having this type of uh, intervention can be helpful in order to number one make people more resilient, as to not to get infected, or if they are already infected, in order not to develop a very severe disease and to uh, decrease the mortality, and or also what is very important to mount the, um, the response to vaccination. So that's also mm -hmm. very important, right? If one is already uh, with, with a lower immune system or has an undergoing chronic inflammation, this is why, for example, autoimmune disease patients uh, had a lot of complications with vaccinations or were not responsive and so on, or the vaccination was not recommended for those. Um, th so those interventions, um, would be overall very beneficial for pandemics. Mm -hmm. And the second paper uh, is actually also quite partially relating to that. So we were um, fortunate to, to pair up um, with, with colleagues from New York um, and um, they had a data set that was, um, that was, <clears throat> uh, that was showing that, um, that was showing the development of, of, of the patients or the longitudinal data in, um, in terms of um, their um, you know, set of infection and up to mortality. And our question was actually very basic. Also to prove maybe what we were discussing in, in our other papers is how is actually the biological age uh, influencing the outcome mm -hmm. Um, versus um, purely basing the, the treatment or the decision and so on on chronological age. And are those who are biologically uh, older than their chronological age mm -hmm. or biologically older than their optimal biological age mm -hmm. at a higher risk of complications and also exitus letalis, so mortality. Mm -hmm. And um, as we were, you know, looking at the data, we actually saw, so we definitely confirmed it. Uh, and, and, and this was something that, that was for us good to see is really biological age is an independent uh, risk factor for poorer outcomes um, in COVID. 
And we were also able, based on all those data and with the help of AI, to build algorithms that, um, that were helpful to develop um, a score, mm. right? To develop a score for, um, for the physicians, for the busy physicians at the emergency room, really to put several of the parameters and to calculate, of course, yet another, but also hopefully helpful risk score um, for those patients. Really, really fascinating. It's uh, it's really amazing the, the breadth of, uh, of of what you're involved here, Evelyn. Um, I, I want to ask you about one other thing before we get to um, uh, the Longevity Science Foundation and, and some other non-science stuff. Well, related to the course, I'm just because I'm so fascinated by all the work you do. But uh, at, at the beginning, when you uh, opened up a bit about the, your background, you know, you introduced us to uh, the the concept of the field of geronto oncology, which you're a major thought leader in. Um, you know, c- connecting these, uh, you know, aging and tumorigenesis. And you mentioned that, um, you know, later in life, it, it's not about genetics anymore, right? We we, we may have a bunch of mutations uh, the first sixty or some odd years, but most likely these pathologic things that are happening in these elderly populations are not new mutations. They're other things. What, what are interesting, can it just, what, what is happening later on? Are, are there some clues there? Uh, is it about inflammation? Is it about other uh, microenvironmental changes? What, what's happening in when you're 70, late 70s, 80s that uh, drives this uh, geronto-oncology uh, dynamic that you study? Oh, that's a, that's a fascinating question. And it is scientific. <laughs> um, so uh, genetics, of course, plays a very important role. I do not yeah. want to undermine this one. Sure. Uh, it was, uh, I just uh, mentioned this in the context that, you know, most of the people think, okay, I have uh, risk of cancer means I have some gene that is right. definitely uh, responsible for, for it. Meanwhile, in most of the entities, the genetic plays um, a very minor role, maybe 5% or less is, um, is based on genetics, or at least what we know so far maybe it's more but we don't know Uh, what we know is definitely that the age um, is a risk factor and um, this is a multitude and a combination of uh, of changes in our body that are both biochemical and physiological uh, as you mentioned um, that are contributing to it Um, and and there is uh, there is a variety so number one is of course definitely the inflammation so we we are talking about the inflammation right Mm -hmm. Um, where we have this chronic inflammation in the body going on on a cellular level and on a system level Um, so that is one major contributor another uh, major contributor is of course um the immune system that is being mm-hmm. uh, devoluted, right? Um, so, and, and this is mounting less resilience to, to many of the pathogens, which is then connected to the chronic inflammation mm-hmm. and maybe some, some underlying infections. And any inflammation and infection is um, somewhat uh, cancerogenic, one might say. Sure. So we know that inflammation is, is very much related to cancer. Um, again, on the cellular level, so hypoxia, for example, in cells and so on, uh, up to the point, and, and mutations in the genes, up to the point that uh, it's on the system level. Um, what we also know, uh, and this is, this is one of the most fascinating uh, areas that, that I'm trying to follow, is really the, 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 the science around the stem cells and the stem cell niches mm-hmm. and how they age. Um, and this particular are- arena is involving in, indeed the elements of the cell itself and what is happening in the cell, how the cell is aging. Mm. Um, but also, also what is what's very fascinating is the arena of the extracellular matrix and the yep. environment of this, right? Yep. So great research from, from, from uh, great scientists, um, Colin Edwald at ETH, for example, is sure. really in his recent paper also very nicely uh, explaining how the extracellular matrix is um, participating in, in those processes. So, all of those, uh, um, let's say, basic research-related um, things in, 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 in aging. And then, of course, on the system level and clinically, what we say, so, uh, what, what we see. So um, I would also mention that um, the neurodegeneration plays a very important role. And um, longevity medicine is, is very much inclusive and very, very... Um, uh, very much focused also on that development because um, there is the somatic health uh, that we might even develop um, much faster in longevity simply because we have 
quantifiable biomarkers, much mm. more than, than in, um, let's say, psychiatry. I don't want to say psychiatry. It's, it's mental health and sure. neurodegeneration, so the cerebral health, right? Sure. There, um, it's it's a lot of qualitative data, so it takes a little bit. Uh, it's it's much more challenging actually to uh, to first of all um, take this qualitative data, clean it. Um, find ways to turn it into something quantitative so that the AI can then further make sense out of it and build trajectories for us and um, and where we then can ultimately find hopefully some of the uh, targets for interventions. Yeah. Very interesting. Really interesting. So um, switching to uh, business or the the big news of the day uh, that, the, that was announced this morning, uh, at least New York time here, uh, Longevity Science Foundation. Um, I'm not the one to break it. I saw, saw it already, but uh, hopefully yeah. I get a little scoop here on the show. Uh, Swiss Foundation, billion dollars over 10 years. Uh, talk a little bit about what it's all about. Um, you know, if you, if you could talk about sort of who's funding it, uh, the structure, uh, what, what the plans are. Obviously, it's a decade-long initiative, but please uh, take the floor and, and, yeah. and give me some scoops. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sure. So, um, with pleasure. So, I'm, I'm very, very much excited about this um, foundation, and I'm very happy that uh, the official news, now not that I can talk about it, came before our interview. So, Longevity Science Foundation um, is, is a foundation that is aiming at fueling and really funding longevity related research mm -hmm. um, on a level that uh, is, uh, let's say, um, very much accessible to those who have innovative ideas. Basically, fueling research and giving the opportunity for those groups who have uh, fascinating and uh, breaking ideas, um, maybe also very let's say ideas that um that would that are not fitting into the frame of of, of academia only or are very brave yep. right so really we need a lot more innovation and a lot of um, people with uh, you know like a like a healthy chutzpah like a really healthy healthy way of um uh of, of promoting the field and, and digging deeper into um any of the basic research up to hopefully, and this is where, you know, where we in the visionary board also wanted to put a lot of um, uh, emphasis in to bring into the clinic. Mm -hmm. So um, in, in terms of the structure and the funding and the business, I am definitely not the, exactly the right person uh, to, to, to explain the backgrounds, but uh, I would refer to, to a recent interview in uh, Longevity, I am sorry, in Lifespan uh, IO mm -hmm. of Gary Mudze, who was actually um, the driving force together with his colleagues um, on, on the structure and the funding. Um, but bottom line, um, there are many people, many philanthropists, many uh, passionates on longevity that are outside of the field. Mm -hmm. And uh, also many people who are just so passionate about it and they do have the means and they do want to help, but they never had a platform or they, they were not maybe aware so much of, of where to, 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 to put their funding in so that the research can be perpetuated. And also maybe to have the trust that actually the money will be spent on the research and there will be an outcome and there will be hopefully something that can be translated to the clinic, mm -hmm. right? So uh, so this is the goal of, of, of the foundation and uh, the visionary board that was created and that I'm extremely and deeply honored to lead um, has, has a panel of experts that are, that are far beyond um, my competencies and they are really the key OLs in the field. Um, but the bottom line is that we will try to, of course, extremely objectively um, and diligently filter and um, adjust the means for research projects that are being applied for and to give them the funds and to, to give them any support that they need so that they can develop. And in the visionary board, we have, uh, as I mentioned before, it's very important that, that we work together. It's extremely multidisciplinary. So what, what I envision for the board, and I'm very happy that it happened, we have the leading AI um, longevity scientist in the field, so Alex mm -hmm. Javaronkov, 
we have the leading geroscientist in the field. Uh, I mean, th there are many, and, and 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 I admire all of them. But uh, one of the leading ones, and, and who is also a good friend, is uh, Dr. Professor Matt Kabelein. Mm -hmm. um, so he um, has uh, joined the visionary board, and then we have um, Eric Verdun from the Buck Institute. Uh -huh. I think sure. <laughs> a personage that I do not even have to introduce, uh, and. Um, and then also we have an MD, uh, PhD, um, Andrea Meyer from now from Singapore, from the mm -hmm. NDF, um, that is um, more on the, that, that, that was a clinician, but is now more on the research side in longevity field. And then last but not least, we have me. So like closing the chain, um, because I'm, I'm mostly, I'm 80, 90% of my time and my, my activity, I'm a clinician. <laughs> that uh, is, is mostly not so visible because, um, it's very hard to post selfies with the you know, patients. So most of my posts and how people uh, perceive me is, uh, is from the research um, and the scientific um, perspective. But most of my time, it, I'm in the clinic. I'm with the patient. So I think we are closing the chain uh, nicely. And hopefully, this will allow us to, um, to, to really identify those projects that, that will be uh, with a great perspective and will contribute to the field. And uh, yeah, so that's um, that's the news of the day. Excellent. Very, very no, good. it's 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 exciting news. And as I said, it's uh, tomorrow is the United Nations Day of uh, Older Persons, uh, 2021. So it's it's great you announced it uh, the day before. So that's that's exciting. Um, uh, Emily, what's uh, just uh, to, to round things off here? I, I, I mean, you have a lot on your plate, but I. I I've seen a lot of news come. You'll be to some different conferences the next couple of months and so forth. What's what's your schedule like? Where, where are we going to see you presenting? Where can uh, we watch you over the Zoom at uh, some of these events? Uh, what's happening in early 2022 for Dr. Evelyn Bischoff? All right. So uh, actually, um, <laughs> an interesting question. I just recently asked uh, one of my mentees if she could help me to run the calendar because I'm a little bit lost. <laughs> But by, by far, I'm not I'm not a superstar. Um, I believe um, some some people such as you know uh, Alex they are presenting four or five times a week. Uh, I'm by far not there. But um, we had you know we had amazing conferences. And I think the highlights um, of of the year are definitely the ARDD conference. And this mm -hmm. is. Uh, this is also the venue where we had for the first time in this year a uh, longevity medicine workshop that we will hopefully develop and that will that will grow mm -hmm. and other workshops will be implemented. So for 2022, um, you know, stay tuned for ARDD. It's it's I think it's also such as just like longevity medicine. This conference is like exploding in, in quality and uh, bringing together some of the best minds. And one can learn a lot. Um, another conference that I was participating in um, lately, uh, just last week, was Longevity Investors Conference, mm. uh, which um, I'm by far not an economist, but uh, it's so beautiful that on, on this platform where you know those economists and investors and, and all those people from, from this area uh, are coming together, um, that they are, you know, they see the necessity of us scientists and, and clinicians to come and also to speak about longevity medicine. We, we are going hand in hand. So that's another thing for 2022. And uh, on the way, <laughs> there, um, there are also other great conferences and uh, you will be seeing me soon um, at the Sino uh, European Summit in Berlin. Of course, hybrid, I'm, I'm still in Shanghai where I will be talking on the 7th of October on um, data and how data uh, can transform the medicine. There I will specifically talk about longevity medicine, also um, specifically in the in the relation of China and how amazing progress in China can and will influence um, Europe and, and other countries. And then also on the Metabesity Conference 2021 mm -hmm. in November, and uh, also on the Healthy Years Conference in November in 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 Portugal. Well, I, I will I will be I will be speaking also and connecting um, on, in a hybrid level uh, on those conferences. So end of November, uh, you know, digitally, and the seventh of October digitally, and then. Um, many on-site conferences here in Shanghai. So whoever is here, whoever is listening and, and is around, um, please do join. We have um, 
partially amazing conferences that are starting now in uh, in, in in the area of uh, oncology and as we mentioned at the beginning gerontology oncology is something that i'm still extremely deeply passionate about and uh, if i may also uh, you know give a little bit of a teaser Please. here in shanghai we are um, now creating uh, some of the first geroncological centers. So mm. really centers of excellence that um, are focusing specifically on the oldest old cancer patients uh, in terms of diagnostics and specifically therapies. And what we want to do is to really develop protocols and, um, and, and guidelines and hopefully at the end of the day really also guidelines that will be uh, approved by by the caring and the CISIP bodies on how to diagnose and how to um, how to deploy which biomarkers to identify how those oldest old cancer patients, those extremely frail and vulnerable patients, uh, should be treated. You know mm -hmm. uh, how the protocols have to be adjusted <clears throat> that are deployed in younger patients. Uh, what are the therapies that will be safer and still yield the best outcomes? And who ultimately is the one to, to, to decide which treatment to take, right? How do we balance the quality of life of the patient <clears throat> versus the wish of having an extended quantity of life? So is it the family? Is it the doctor? Is it the patient? Mm -hmm. um, so all of those things will be discussed and we'll uh, have a summit early um, early 2022 in January and uh, that uh, you know I, I will I will uh, help to spread the news because we will do it in a hybrid way also with global speakers but also here on site in Shanghai. Outstanding outstanding you're pretty busy. <laughs> <laughs> oh it's a really really fascinating journey Evelyn I mean I just I wish you the best with all this moving it forward uh, I know you do great at all <laughs> you clearly have uh uh, amazing, um, you know, portfolio here, uh, very successful portfolio and it's, it's going to keep going. So really, really excited to watch it. And, um, for, uh, for everybody that is going to be listening to, uh, this particular episode, uh, on our podcast or watching on the YouTube channel, uh, you've been listening to Dr. Evelyn Bischoff, uh, preventative precision longevity medicine specialist extraordinaire, Biogerontological and geronto-oncological specialist extraordinaire, um, longevity physician at Human Longevity Inc., clinical advisor in silico medicine, scientific advisory at Hall Musk, and most recently chair of the visionary board of the Longevity Science Foundation. Keep an eye on her. Uh, Evelyn, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule, getting up so early to come talk to us. Uh, thanks for everything you're doing there. And as we say on our show, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow for all of us. Really very impressive story. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for, you know, for bringing all of those topics. If I may just uh, say, um, um, a person is just as strong as the people that, um, that, that are around uh, the person. And I was just very, very, uh, fortunate to have some of the greatest minds um, uh, around me that I was able to learn from and um, also to work with with you know some of the companies that I deeply admire so in Silico Holmask and also Maximon from from Switzerland mm. um, right the uh, very very promising uh, longevity uh, company builder so bottom line um, I hope that I can motivate people to join the field to, because we need everybody and especially right. physicians. So dear colleagues, whoever is out there, um, clinicians uh, or scientists, uh, you know, MDs, please do join the field, reach out to us. We are very inclusive and, and we want you to, to, to be a part of, of, of longevity medicine. And thank you, Ira, so much also for staying up so late to talk to me all the way from New York and for having me on the show. It's a great pleasure and honor. Thank you. Be well.